Hello and welcome to this recap of today's CodeBuddies.org live coding session. CodeBuddies is a global community of amazing people who help each other become better at software development through conversations on Slack and peer-to-peer -peer organized study groups and virtual hangouts. Today we're continuing with the Western Friend website. Western Friend is the official publication of Quakers in Pacific, North Pacific, and Intermountain yearly meetings. Large groups of uh, Quakers in the Western United States, mostly in Northern Mexico. Western Friend has been, uh, it's a nonprofit organization. It's uh, been published for many years under a couple of different names. If we look at the magazine, its primary means of fundraising is through this magazine. Um, subscribers get access to the most recent three issues, which is about six months worth of content. Issues are published every other month. And everything after that, or older than that, I should say, is publicly available, including all of these archive issues that were published under Western Friend and the Deep Archive, which was published under Friends Bulletin and dates back to 1929. Now, all of these Deep Archive issues have been scanned and hosted and are being hosted by the Internet Archive, which is also a nonprofit organization based in the United States. Uh, located in California. So you can see here we got 600 issues of Friends Bulletin, which was the predecessor to Western Friend, that are publicly available on the Internet Archive. Now the goal of this feature is to integrate the Internet Archive content with the new version of the website, which we're creating Wagtail. So we can take a quick look at how that renders in the Wagtail template, it's basically the same thing. It renders a title, a table of contents, and then the issue. Let me refresh this issue real quick. Uh, so it starts at page zero, this is interesting to note. And when you click one of these articles uh, in the table of contents, it'll turn the page to that article. This is just testing content, so I said default title and some <clears throat> arbitrary page number. but all of this is wired together with a little bit of JavaScript and an iframe. There's just uh, uh, not, not a lot of moving parts. So let's take a quick look at the content editing side of things. I suppose we can just edit this page directly. So in the Wagtail admin, you can see we're editing an archive issue. And this happens to be a really long title. Um, the Friends Bulletin issues didn't really have titles like the Western Friend uh, issues do. Uh, each Western Friend issue has a theme and we use those uh, as the title of the magazine. So eh, anyway, <laughs> all of these Friends Bulletin issues look something like that. They have a unique Internet Archive identifier, which you can see here in the URL of Internet Archive, uh, as well as somewhere in the metadata here, the identifier. So those will always be unique. And those were auto-generated, I think, or something when they were archived in this collection. Uh, the archivist might have, Andrea Mills might have done that. Now I want to mention also that this, this archive of 600 items is being freely hosted by the Internet Archive. And they even took all the physical documents in, in like boxes of them, and uh, they scan them free of charge. I mean, it's a really remarkable organization. If you have a chance just to check out the Internet Archive, it's really great. There's a lot of movies, videos, music on here. You can upload your own uh, and share it with people. Um, there's even old computer software. So it's a very good uh, service that they're providing. So back to this content, we have the identifier. Each item on the Internet Archive gets a unique identifier. Um, then there's some fields we're porting over from the previous website. Uh, I don't remember exactly the purpose of this, but in any case, I just put some content here because it was a, a required field. I might change the data model based on Mary's feedback. Here's where it started to get a little bit complicated, but <clears throat> the idea here is the content management should be as simple for the editor as possible or the content manager as possible. Everything should be done through the user interface and hopefully in one kind of view. 
uh, wouldn't really want them to ping pong around adding, you know, an archive issue and then adding one or more archive articles and then adding one or more archive article authors. I'm aiming to have this all in just one form for this particular feature. It didn't quite work out as elegantly as I was hoping, but overall uh, had good success with Wagtail and even got to learn uh, some upcoming changes to Wagtail 2.8, which will make this, hopefully make this uh, much more streamlined. In any case, this archive articles section is actually what is called uh, an inline, uh, inline field. It displays another entity in line when you're creating uh, one type of entity, it displays another type of entity. It lets you edit those, the fields on that entity. And then we went one layer deeper. So we're here displaying an archive article, which is a new content type. We'll take a look at the data model in a moment, which has a title, a table of contents page, and a PDF page. <clears throat> now, just really quickly before we carry on, the, let me get to an example here. These issues sometimes have tables of contents in them, right here, for example. And those tables of contents, in this case, the table of contents is actually on page three. Uh, but sometimes I'm guessing that older issues, for example, might have a table of contents um, that's not on a numbered page. So if we go back to like 1929 and filter that, uh, maybe I'm mistaken here, or they might not have a table of contents at all. Yeah, so it's just a little bit uh, fuzzy. <laughs> so that's the table of contents that's displayed to the reader in the physical document and hence the um, PDF. But then you, for the page turner, the PDF has its own numbering system starting at number zero, page zero is the first page and one, two, etc. Now briefly, I would just like to uh, say my opinion on uh, zero base indexing, I think uh, it's a mistake that the software industry uses zero-based indexing in high-level languages like JavaScript and Python. Uh, the reason being, I believe zero-based indexing is based on the way computers operate in binary logical computers, something extending out of that. Whereas programming languages should, to the extent possible, especially Python and these high-level languages, should be based on the way humans think and operate. And when humans count things, when we people count, we start counting with one. We don't start counting at zero. So what, what I think the zero-based indexing is a case of the implementation, the way the computer works, leaking into the abstraction, the way we talk to the computer, the way we access list items by index. So in any case, I think it's, that's probably those led to many off by one errors and perhaps significant bugs um, based on uh, something that sh should be avoidable in my opinion. Uh, this should be page one and you know, I'm getting a list of pages and I'm getting the first one there. We have one apple or zero apples means no apples. Okay, so that's enough of my brief uh, aside on why I believe one base indexing is appropriate for human level languages where we're interacting with computers. I think the Julia language has adopted that and there's probably other examples. And I wish Python would, but I know it's a little bit uh, not going to happen basically because you know, it would be a pretty big, a pretty significant change in the language. All right. I do overall though enjoy Python and have really enjoyed my experience with the Wagtail developer uh, community. Great. Let's get back to it. So I'll show you in the code why that whole um, sort of aside about um, zero base indexing was relevant. Very small detail, but. So we have the two types of page numbers, one for the rendering in the template and the other for using in the JavaScript code. Let me just go ahead and view this live again. So I'll show you again. So we have one that's embedded here in the template. And if I inspect this element and make sure that it's not gonna be covered up by the video, we also have the page number two here that I arbitrarily put in there <clears throat> that's embedded in the data of the page. And we'll take a look at the code in a minute to generate that. Okay, one layer of nesting deeper, we have archive article, which has one or more authors. So what Wagtail does <coughs> sort of by default using this um, extension called cluster, cluster model, clusterable model, is um, 
well, essentially, it renders a form with three uh, instances of whatever your clusterable model is, three selectors. Uh, this is just hard coded to do this. So you can see I have one author selected here with this drop down, and then it has provided me with three ones. And so every time I do this page, I actually have to delete these three because I, in this case, only have one author, author <laughs> named Mary, not Arthur. And also the selector here is a drop down. And also the selector here is showing me all the pages on the site potentially, which uh, this will not be scalable or easy to use. So ideally this would only be showing us pages of the types that are allowed, um, that are permissible to author these articles, namely people, organizations, and, and these Quaker meetings. Likewise, I would hope to get a widget that allows us to filter or quick find either through a modal dialog or typing a couple of letters. The constraint here being we will need to have created the authors first. All right, so that they can populate in the um, widget. Otherwise, uh, it gets too complicated. I'm already asking quite a lot with these double nested uh, inline entities, uh, which I was really surprised that it worked to begin with. All right. So that said, let's go ahead and take a look at the code. I'll go ahead and bring up the VS code and switch over the window. Here we go. So here's my pull request on GitHub as seen in VS code. I've just installed a new plugin that lets me do this. Uh, I think it's just uh, the top one when you search for GitHub pull request in VS code. <clears throat> Extensions, GitHub pull requests. That's the one I got right here. Pretty popular. So here's the commits. Um, so like the first 30 minutes of the live stream, I was just messing with a, my flake eight rules and running a little bit of lint. I noticed uh, I had enabled auto linting in the last pull request and merged uh, that effort. And now I'm getting a lot of more lint errors. Uh, so I just really hadn't realized that my auto linting was not enabled. So it's good to have reminders and little red squigglies when I've got unused imports or other uh, flake, eight, flake 8 violations. All right, so then it was only a few commits, but it took about three and a half hours. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and take a look. There's uh, essentially three files. I'll, we'll skip over the migrations because that's all contained in the models.py. One thing I did, so initially in that messing with Flake 8 was just to create a setup.cfg file, which VS Code picks up in its Flake 8 integration and allows me to exclude certain files. Like I don't want it to lint my migrations. And I don't care, that's auto-generated code. And it shouldn't really lint anything in Git, but this was copy and pasted from a blog called Simple is Better Than Complex. If you're interested in learning Django, I highly recommend it. Simple is Better Than Complex. The blog is primarily oriented towards Django and Python development with very clear tutorials and examples. And I think the author is pretty auth uh, active, excuse me. So the other thing here is then I can define flake eight rules. I was getting errors that I was, some of my lines are above 79 characters. I'm not super strict on the 79 character uh, width. I think, I don't know. So I went with the recommended uh, 119, again from simple is better than complex. We'll see how that affects the review process here. So the other two files where the changes are is a few, a few new model definitions and then a template. So let's take a, look, take a look at the model first. So you can see these red lines. These are just unused um, imports that my linter was catching for me early on. And then some cleanup I had disabled. I was using PyLint at some point in this project and um, now that I'm using Flake 8, I just took out some of the PyLint metadata and the bulk of the work is here. You can see, oh, well, 335. Yeah, almost 100 lines of code. Maybe, just uh, not, too, not too bad though. Uh, so the, we introduced, I think, three new entities. Archive issues, archive articles, and archive article author. Again, we have that three layer uh, cake here. An issue consists of multiple uh, articles, one or more articles. And an article has one or more authors. It's sometimes, well, sometimes it's an anonymous author. So eh, I think that still counts as one though. 
So the archive issue is going to inherit from the wagtail page model. That gives us some things out by default, like a title field, uh, auto-generating page slugs, and a revision um, feature where you can uh, create draft versions and publish a draft or keep it private until you're done, <clears throat> etc. So we've kind of covered that in several of these other live streams. The fields we have is an, the Internet Archive Identifier, which is a character field, and the Western Friend Volume, which is an unknown, uh, I don't remember the purpose of that field. And that's it for the archive issue. Again, there's a title that we're inheriting from the page. And we'll just display those field panels in an inline panel to show us, to allow us to choose one, or actually create one or more articles. So we'll look for this archive articles. The related name is the magic here. <clears throat> when you have um, sort of a clusterable model that has defined a parental key, you define the parent model here, archive issues, and a related name. That means when I'm looking at a given archive issue, I can get all of the archive articles using that keyword phrase. It's like a property. It allows you to tra traverse into it. It returns. A, um, a query set basically so you can evaluate it lazily you don't it doesn't do it up front unless you ask for it up front and so an archive article has a title and the reason I'm explicitly defining a title here is because I'm not inheriting from the wagtail page model uh, this is one of the first times in this project I've deviated from using that I've been pretty consistent about using it because you get a lot of benefits but these articles really aren't uh, intended to be displayed as their own page and in this website. They're really only used for generating a table of contents. So we do need a title though. And then we have those two page numbers, one for the table of contents in the HTML template, and two for the PDF page number used in the JavaScript code and as an attribute, a data attribute. Um, then we have the parental key again to the archive issue. Since I am defining my own model here, we then also need to define a string method and just return the title. The panels here, we're just displaying a title and then grouping the page numbers together in a multi-field panel so they're kind of naturally uh, grouped uh, with a little bit of uh, inline documentation. And an inline panel going one layer deeper in our, our little tree here to get the authors. Now the authors again is defined to the related name of a parental key. So an orderable is I guess basically inheriting from cluster model, clusterable model. I might not have to have had this inheritance in both places. Uh, the parental key to the archive article. And on delete, we're cascading so that if you delete this archive issue, it's going to delete the related content. It'll clean itself up. Since you're editing on the same form, it might as well delete on the same form. Then we've got a foreign key relationship for the authors to select a wagtail page from one of these allowed page types. Uh, either a person, a meeting, or organization can be an author on one of these uh, archive articles. <clears throat> so it should choose a page, it should display a page chooser panel, but unfortunately, the user interface is not working properly. It's just showing this drop down menu. So there's actually an active bug report. Uh, wagtail. No. See if I can find it really quick. Uh, I'll just give an example of how a discussion we had. So uh, there's ongoing work to make these um, nested inline panels uh, kind of a formal. Uh, formal support for those, um, but unfortunately the um, other types of field widgets in the dropdown aren't working properly, like an image chooser panel or, um, you know, mine is a page chooser panel. So there's known issue there, and essentially I opened up this issue, I opened it two hours ago and got a response, like within 10 minutes or so. They closed the issue, but did so politely and said, hey, there's a related issue to that. I mean, I've had just a really great experience with the Wagtail core developers. 
and the general wagtail ecosystem. I'm not sure um, <clears throat> the relationship of some of the people I've gotten support from on Stack Overflow. I'm not sure of their relationship to the wagtail core, but I've gotten very quick responses on Stack Overflow as well. Okay, let's hop back over to the code and try to wrap up this review session because this shouldn't be a, as long as the live coding session. So the last thing we wrote essentially is this template. And since it's a its own thing, we don't really need to display it side by side with anything else. So we're extending our base HTML. In our content, we're displaying the page title. Then we want to render a table of contents. So for each article in the archive articles. So the page archive articles, if you recall from this models.py, uh, the page now refers to archive issue. And the archive articles refers to these um, clusterable items that are linking to it. And then we'll dis um, we're not going to display our authors yet. So, <clears throat> so for each of those articles, we're just going to put it in a list item and display, you know, the title and the page number, just to have something in the UI. Um, then we're going to actually display the issue. Now this code, uh, the Internet Archive allows you to embed these and it even gives you some a snippet to embed it as an iframe. Um, we had to deviate from using this snippet um, because we need, uh, or it's desirable to have the table of contents to turn the page. So essentially, sorry, let me back up just one moment. Notice here on the list items, we have these data elements, the Internet Archive identifier and the PDF page number. Those will come up in a moment in the code in this on click event where we'll actually turn the page. I'll demo that again when we get to the code. Uh, so, in the iframe here, uh, it's really an archive, uh, inner archive PDF viewer, and you can stream the PDF to an iframe. And by stream, it's not just uh, the raw PDF, but it's actually a viewer with page turning and a bunch of other features. Um, so, let's take a quick look at that. If I hop back over here and display it. So it's this black area uh, that has a link to the item and then these page turn buttons and then full screen will take you over to the item page. So the PDF viewer does a little bit more than just simply streaming a PDF to be rendered in a browser native viewer. All right, let's hop back over the code real quick and wrap this up again. Trying, trying to keep this brief. Uh, allows people to go full screen with that button, which actually takes them over to the Internet uh, Archive. So our turn page, um, it takes in the elements. You notice when I call the turn page, we get this LI, it gets passed into it, along with its data dictionary here. So we can look in that data set for the um, PDF page number and the Internet Archive identifier. Now, if you notice, these get converted from kebab case over to camel case for us automatically. This is something new to me, so just I was impressed by that. Um, so we take the page number from that data set and then we actually um, do the offsetting for zero base indexing of the PDF. In any case, there it is. One line, not a big deal, but I think those add up and collectively, I think we've spent a lot of time either writing code or debugging and troubleshooting this um, zero base indexing. I don't know. It just we're trying to keep uh, things at a higher level of abstraction to keep it easier and more natural for humans to interact with computers. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. Uh, similarly, with the Internet Archive identifier, we just grab that from the data set, and we just construct a new URL with the same identifier, but changing the page. So this is really well, basically the same. I could probably take this. This is just in an archive specific URL syntax, but essentially it's telling us <clears throat> we're embedding this in another page, in another web page, and we're actually displaying a particular page of the PDF. And we're showing two pages side by side of the PDF, so it's not a single page view, although we might switch to that. Uh, and then we find that um, PDF viewer and we change the attribute. So let's just take a look at how that looks, how that works one more time. We'll wrap it up. So if I refresh this page, we load in. The PDF is at page zero. I can change the page, you know, either clicking here or with these. 
uh, I can start a page here and when I click on an article, the table of contents will actually change that for me. Uh, we can come back to the main site and see that in action here with some of these. So we've got, well, a few art, uh, pages here, not very big newsletter. This is one of the older ones where they're only publishing a few pages. But let's see if we can go to page two or, well, it's not really working so good on this. Oh, there it is, it's a little bit delayed. And back to page one, page four. So it's just a really convenient way of viewing these. I think it's just a nice touch uh, to let you navigate right to the, the correct article. It's a little bit small, we might make this a little bit taller. Yep, but that's about it. That's as far as we've gone today. A few more things we'll do to continue here is touch up this table of contents, display the article author, and maybe make it a table or some other nice um, display. Maybe it can be toggleable, you can hide it. Um, and then hoping that Wagtail 2.8 comes out soon because it turns out there is um, has been a pull request that was merged and added to the 2.8 timeline that'll fix some of our, our issues we're experiencing with these nested uh, panels. Okay, well, again, this has been a CodeBuddies.org live coding session. Appreciate your time and watching this. I hope to see you around the CodeBuddies community. Uh, if you're wanting to learn or teach uh, any kind of technology, you're more than welcome. We have uh, other working groups. I'm mainly focused on Wagtail, Django, and Python. But there are other working groups, uh, for example, Ruby on Rails, PHP, JavaScript. Uh, there's data science, track, all sorts of stuff going on. So hop on over to codebuddies.org and hope to see you around the community. Thanks a lot for watching and have a great day.